because I, I was going to have some internet uh, work going on. So I was very scared that I might not have class. So I recorded everything. So this thing is not being recorded. So you can talk. A um, couple of quick questions. Did you watch the videos, guys? That's a yes or no question. You can answer. Yes. <laughs> So the point of showing you those videos was that you have a discussion coming up. Uh, the discussions in this course um, are going to get quite intense because they're going to be connected to forensics. Um, so the first one, I think, which is very interesting is going to be on death penalty. We'll also be doing one on the criminal gene uh, and we'll talk about it as we go on. But what I do want you to do, however, is um, so when you look for resources, uh, they need to be uh, proper resources. Please don't use Wikipedia as your resource. You do have to state the resources you have used. Um, and you have to please read the rubric before you post, okay? Because those will be graded very strictly. Your first discussion was only for introducing yourself. Uh, pretty much everybody got full points on it because all you had to do was introduce yourself in that. This one is pretty intense. Please make sure you're following the rubric and you're posting. So when you are actually using reference articles, you can use reference articles. You can also use, um, what is that, TED Talks uh, from PhDs and from professors that think one way or the other about death penalty or whatever in order to make your point, okay? So I'm not necessarily asking for your opinion about death penalty. I'm asking for scientific resources that back both uh, death penalty as being a good way of punishment versus why death penalty doesn't work. Is that clear? Is that clear to everyone? Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I am going to um start today's uh, lecture how many of you have looked at entomology no one yet okay so we are going to be oops you're already looking at module six because i'm in my um my canvas account okay we're going to go to the powerpoints for today and we are going to be looking at entomology and after this lecture i will make sure i will post uh, both the entomology, um, what is that? Uh, entomology lecture, as well as how to do the worksheet. Also, have you guys had a chance to finish the worksheets from last week? No, I haven't. I can't. Haven't? Sorry? I can't. This is uh, really hard to, uh, to do it. It's really hard to do it. Okay, so if you have very specific questions, I'm going to finish the entomology thing or we can even take it up because I've recorded the entomology lecture. So if you want to actually focus on that because that's an intense worksheet, there will be questions from that worksheet on the exam. We can look at that worksheet for now. Do you want me to focus on that? Yeah. Okay, so let's go to that worksheet and I'm going to go back to week i think i have to go to week it's not is it posted in this week or last week last week am i right okay which worksheet would you like me to go to uh one a one a okay yeah Okay, uh, I thought I, okay, I thought I had actually put in the right one. Okay, do you have any questions on this one on gas chromatography, which is pretty straightforward, I think? I think you saw, you, you, you see. Hey guys, can out. you quickly hold for one quick second? One quick second, please. Okay, so I actually, what I did do um, for this one is, hold on, okay. Um, 
I thought I had uploaded the one that is proper because remember I said this one has moved when I uploaded it. It was supposed to be at 0.45. Yeah. Yeah. So I will. I don't know why I forgot to do it. I thought I had on my list of to-do things, but I didn't do. So does anybody have questions on the gas chromatography? No, we're good. Not really. Okay. All right. It's the, uh, the one. Yeah, right there. Right here. Uh, okay. So, then, so here is the questions. Yeah, go ahead. I know you had a question. Do you want to ask the question? Can you, can you explain it again? Yes, like, absolutely. I can I can explain it a hundred times. I was trying to figure it out by myself, but I couldn't understand it. So. Yeah. Okay. So the first rule is you need to know where the carbons are. And the next question is you need to know where hydrogen are. Okay. So I have, I have put this over here. You should read this. So put a C for carbon atom at the bends and at the ends. Okay. That do not have any element listed. That's rule number one. Okay. The second rule, um, so this is just, okay. The second rule is then make sure carbon has four bonds to complete the octet. If it doesn't, then put hydrogen atoms so carbon has four bonds. Remember, oxygen needs two bonds. Nitrogen needs three bonds to complete the octet, okay? So let's do, did we do number one and number number uh, A and C on, uh, on last Thursday? Yeah. Okay, so I'll go ahead and do B now. Can we go over A again? Can I go over A? Absolutely, I can go over A. So rule number one it is when you are given the formula and you have to write, you have to write the molecular formula. The first thing you need to do is how many carbons and how many hydrogens you have. Okay. So you're going to go ahead and you're going to go and put a carbon atom at the bends. Okay. These are the bends. Okay, and at the ends. So there are no ends over here. So right now I'm gonna go and put carbon atoms over here. Okay, so there's gonna be one carbon atom here. Okay, I, hold on. I don't know what I just did, but let's see if I can do draw. And I'm gonna take this. So I'm gonna put one C, right? C, C. C, 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 at the bends, C, C. So do I have a carbon at all the bends? Yeah. There are no ends that are exposed. Okay, now the next thing I need to find out is does carbon have four bonds to it? So look at this carbon. It has one, two, three. It needs a fourth bond, correct? And then you put an H. Yes? Mm -hmm. Carbon, it has one, two, three, and four. Oh. Okay. Carbon, and you're going to do one. So there are two bonds here. Two, three, four. So carbon has four bonds here. Let's look at this carbon. One, two, three. This carbon needs a fourth bond. Okay. This carbon over here, one, two, three, it needs a fourth bond. One, two, three, and a fourth bond. Yes. One, two, three, and a fourth bond. Okay. One, two, three, and a fourth bond. So now one, two, three, four. So all the carbons have four bonds now? Yes. Okay. So now let's count. Okay. So we need to write the chemical formula. So how many C's do we have? Let's count the C's. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So we have C10. Oh. I just counted the carbons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Can you see my arrow move? Yes. Okay, so it does everybody agree that there are 10 carbons? Yes. 
Okay, so this would be C10. Sorry, I have to write with a mouse so you can imagine how painful that would be, okay? And then I have to count the number of hydrogens, okay? So let's count the number of hydrogens. There are three here, three here. So six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 1, 2, 3, 13, 14. Did I count? Oh, 15. This one is the 15th one. So H15. Does everybody agree H or 15? Yes. And then we have one N. And an O. Yes? Mm. So yeah. ephedrine is C10, H15, and O. <laughs> is everybody with me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want, I'm going to wait. Do you want to go ahead and do B? I just want to know that you can do B. I'm not actually recording this because I'm asking for your input. And I think... Last week we recorded this. So can you go ahead and do B? I will wait for a few minutes. I want to know if you get it right because this one is pretty straightforward. Can you go ahead and do B for me? Okay. How are you doing, guys? Still working. Okay. Bless you. Thank you. Okay, do I have an answer, guys? I got C, A, H, 9, and O2. Yes, that's correct. That is C, 8, H, 9, and O2. Good job. So how did we do that? We put a C at all the bends, right? C and C 
and see and at the ends and then we see does it have four bonds so it has one so you're gonna have three bonds okay i'm not gonna put the hydrogen it's very painful to write with a with a mouse uh, oxygen has two carbon has one two three four right now carbon has one two three four over here one two three so it needs four one two three 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 four correct and nitrogen needs to have how many nitrogen needs to have three bonds Yes? Yes. Okay, so then we count the C's. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it is C8, H9. So there's three over here of hydrogen. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, H9. And of course, N, O, and O. So O2, NO2, <clears throat> NO2. So that was pretty straightforward, correct? Yes? Yeah. So yes. that is, by the way, in case you were wondering what that is, that is acetaminophen or Tylenol. And ethylene glycol, which is this one, is the most straightforward one, right? You don't have to do anything for this one. You just have to go ahead and write it down, right? What is this one? You can just tell me that. Does anybody want to tell me what this one is? C2H602. Yeah, that is C2H602. Okay. And now the next question is, now that you know, now that you know how to write out the chemical formula, it's asking you for the molecular mass, right? So this one should be pretty straightforward. So if you're doing it for the first one, C10H15NO. So this is C times for um, for carbon, I believe, I think it's 12. So 10 multiplied by 12 plus 15 multiplied by H is always one plus N should be, I think 14 and O should be 16, correct? for calculating oh. the molecular mass? Well, uh, how we calculate A? Can you say it again? Yeah, I can. So ephedrine is C10H15NO. So if you go to, so if you go to the periodic table, the molecular mass of carbon is 12, right? I just remember it. So 10 multiplied by 12 because there are 10 molecules there are 10 carbon atoms, sorry. So you multiply 10, multiply by 12, plus there are 15 hydrogens. So 15 multiplied by one, plus I believe nitrogen is 14, 14 point something, plus 14, plus oxygen is 16. So if you multiply that and add all of them together, you should get, I think one, so hold on. One, so uh, what's the hydro, hydro right now number? Hydrogen is one. You have to go to the periodic table for that, which is in the PowerPoint. One uh, time uh, multiply uh, 15? One multiplied by 15, yes. And then, uh, and what's the NO number? N, nitrogen, I believe it is 14, and oxygen, I believe it is 16. Can somebody double check that? Hmm. That's just okay. my memory, so I could be making a mistake. I, I don't believe I'm making a mistake. I think that's correct. That's right? Okay, yeah. I think you should get 165. You should get an answer close to 165 grams per mole. Yes? Yes. Okay, so did everybody understand how to calculate the molecular mass? Yeah. Okay, I can wait. 
can somebody do the molecular mass of acetaminophen? You know, acetaminophen is going to be, uh, I think, C8HNNO2. Can somebody give me the answer for number 13 before we move on? Okay. It's 151. It's 151? Okay, 151 grams per mole. What about number 14? Around 149. 149 grams per mole. Okay, sounds about right. And what about what about number 15? 62. 62 grams per mole. Okay, so I am going to share answer sheets for, I'm going to share the answer key for all the worksheets, but it's not going to be done until the very end because I want people to work at it. It's always easier to look at the answer sheet, but then you might not understand how to do the worksheets. And it's very important for you to know how to do that for the exam. Yes? Can you explain yes. it one more time? I'm so sorry. That, that's okay. What, what, is, what was the question? How to find the, uh, the gra grams per mole. Oh, how do you find the grams per mole? Okay, let's do that. Okay, the, I, I'm glad you asked because if you don't ask, I wouldn't know. So yeah. let's do this one, C10, H15, NO. Okay, so I know there are, there are 10 atoms of carbon, correct? So carbon is, let's see if I can, um, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna write over here. Uh, how do I remove this drawing thing? Does anybody know? You can um, do the eraser. Eraser. Good job. How, where, where is the eraser? <laughs> to the left of where your cursor is. Oh, right yes. There. Thank you. Okay. So do I, okay. Do, yeah. Okay. How do I, if I want to type, how do I, uh, okay. I think I removed that. Okay. So this one is C10. This one is C10. H15, H15, N, O, correct? So how do I calculate this? I'm gonna do, so carbon, so carbon is, uh, this is gonna be 10 atoms of carbon multiplied by 12 which is a molecular weight of carbon that you actually have to look up on the periodic table. You know how to look that up on the periodic table? Remember the, the first PowerPoint we did in this um, in the CSI2? It's the periodic table is there. One is the atomic mass and the other one is the atomic number. So you look at the atomic mass. Okay. Okay. All right. So if you have a question, you should ask me because I will not know otherwise. Okay. Uh, plus how many we have... 15 of hydrogen, 15 atoms of hydrogen. So you have 15 multiplied by the molecular weight of hydrogen is usually 1.001. I'm just gonna write one, okay? And then we have plus, uh, we have one molecule of nitrogen and nitrogen I believe is 14. Can somebody double check that for me? Plus, sorry? Yes, it's 14. Am I right? Okay. And then we have one, one, one of oxygen. So because it's one, I'm not multiplying. So oxygen molecular weight is 16. I am pretty sure about that. So if I, if I solve this, so that is 120, correct? Plus 120 plus 15 times one is 15, right? Plus 14 plus... 16 and that should be equal to oops and that should be equal to if I add all of this together so 120 plus 15 plus 14 plus 16 is going to give me 165 grams per mole yes yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Was that clearer? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so just to let you know, I didn't record this. I haven't recorded this. So if you want to go ahead and take a screenshot, by all means, do it on your phone.
Okay. All right, so do you need help with any other sheets before I can move on with entomology? Yeah, can you go over to a, just the first question? The first question? Can this I, one? No, yes, go ahead. Oh, yes, what's the question on this one? I mean, up to a, worship to a, not this one, the other one, the worship. The, the unknown powder? I mean the other worksheet, the 2A one. Oh, the other worksheet. Yeah. Okay. Hold on one second. One, one second. Um, I have to do stop share, screen share. This one? Is this the one you want me to do? 1B? Uh, is that on the worksheet 2A? I don't know. Oh, 2A. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So stop share. And again, I have to do a screen share. Where is that worksheet? Okay, there it is. Okay, can you guys see it now? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, hold on. It's gonna stop share now after I do enable editing. Okay, so this is just showing you um, for the CODIS, remember um, y chromosome, if you take the Y chromosome, these are the different low sides we look on the Y chromosome. Okay, that's all that is showing you. And then it is showing you, the first question over here is, so now we are looking at semen samples for Y stirs, okay? Y stirs, remember, are short tandem repeats on the Y chromosome, okay? So they have taken the semen sample from the victim's bed sheets where she was raped by her boyfriend. Um, and her boyfriend was 4-3. So 4-3 is in the fourth generation, the third person. Okay, so this one. So in biology, boys are represented by squares and girls are represented by circles. Okay, so 4-3 is this girl's boyfriend and he raped her and they got the semen samples from the victim's bed sheet. okay? 4-3 is also missing in action. The y star profile shown below was entered in FBI CODIS, okay? So they entered the, the DNA profile that they got from the bed sheet into CODIS. Remember, CODIS doesn't have a match for the y stars. They only have a match for your for your uh, D, for your chromosomal DNA, okay, not for your Y chromosome, all right. Uh, so they generated this. So now, if they have to go back and get a sample for Y chromosome, okay, to see whether this person was indeed the one, where else do you think they can get the same Y chromosome profile? So, without a Y star reference profile, the defendant's claim cannot be verified, okay? How could one use the family tree to obtain y star reference sample to verify the, def the defendant's claim? So they're asking, how can you verify without, without a proper way to verify? Where else can you get the same Y chromosome that this person has in order to verify the claim of the defendant, okay? So remember, Y chromosome, if you are a male, you have one X and one Y. If you are a female, you have two Xs, okay? So Y chromosome does not go through any crossing over or exchange of genetic material. So the Y chromosome in 4-3 is gonna be the same as the Y chromosome in 3-3, and it's gonna be the same Y chromosome as 2-2, and is gonna be the same Y chromosome as one, two. So all these people will have the same Y chromosome. There is no change. 
So if I needed, if I needed, if I needed to verify this, I could get the chromosome sample from here. I could get a DNA sample from here, or I can get it from the great grandfather as well. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. And then it says trace the lineage of the Y chromosome profile for all the other males depicted in the tree. So now let's say you're looking at this family tree and I want to see, um, go ahead and do draw. So who shares the same Y chromosome as four, six? Can somebody tell me? So four, six, let's put across here. Who has the same Y chromosome as four, six? Uh, three, five. Three, five. His father will have it. So three, five will have it. Who else can we go for? Two, three. Two, three. Who else? Nobody else, right? Because this one, this one is not the father for this one. Okay. Now let's look at this one. Have two males over here, two brothers over here, where would we look for their DNA pattern? Why DNA pattern? So for this one, where would you look for a Y DNA pattern? Who's their dad? 3-8. 3-8, you would go to 3-8. Okay, where else? Two, where would you get this guy's DNA pattern from? 2-6. Yep, 2-6. Where else? 1-2. One, 1-2. Two. One, two. That's oh, all that's being asked for. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Why is, why can you, why can you, why are 2-3 and 3-5, why can you get, why can't, why do they have the same, why? Because aren't they not related? Uh, two, three, and three, five. Why are they? Two, uh, three, and three, five. Isn't two, three the father? Of yes, you are correct. We made a mistake here. See, this girl, his daughter, is married to this guy, so you cannot get it from here. So this is wrong. You're correct. Right, Sorry, you. I didn't notice that, but you did. So that's very good. You Great cannot get it from, me. right? So sometime a victim might say that this person raped me. They don't have any DNA. So where do you get the DNA? You can go straight to the dad and get the y star pattern analysis because they share the same Y chromosome. And then you can look for other pieces of evidence that they, that will connect this four, six to the crime scene, right? Yes. Yes. Could you explain how that's not the dad? Can I explain what? That, that's the husband. That, who is the husband? Three, five. Three, five is the husband. Yes, so, so look at this. So three and four are married, which is why they have a line between them. And then a vertical line comes down and they have one square and one circle. That means they have one son and they have one daughter. The daughter is married to this guy and then they have one son and two daughters. So this guy is not this person's father. Therefore, you okay. cannot get the wise her pattern from this person. He has a different father. Remember, this, this girl is married to, his daughter is married to this guy. That's why. Got it, that makes sense, thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay, any other questions, guys? No? Mm. Okay, so can I go to entomology now? Yes, you can. Okay, wonderful. Uh, okay, let's go to entomology. And we're gonna go to week five, right?
So I'm not recording any of this, so you can talk. I actually had to go through a lot of loopholes to record a synchronous lecture because they will not let me do that. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, we are going to see how using entomology helps us solve crimes. Does anybody know what entomology is? No? So it is the application and study of insects and other arthropod biology to criminal matters. Okay, so keep in mind that when a person dies, uh, and depending on where the body has been left, um, the body can be infested by insects, right? Because the body has to go through decomposition and the worms and, you know, flies will eventually uh, lay eggs leave maggots that will eat the decaying flesh and will um, consume the body, okay? Uh, we look at entomology primarily for death investigations, okay? Usually a person is murdered, they're thrown somewhere in the brush and you want to find out why that has happened and you want to find out the time of death and so forth, okay? So this PowerPoint is mainly going to deal with how do we use entomology to determine time of death? So far, we have done how do we use the body temperature to determine the time of death? How do you determine alcohol concentration in a dead person, okay? Now, we are going to look at how entomology can be used to determine time of death. So in general, when, when, when people die, um, the most common uh, maggot that is found at the dead body site is that of a blowfly, okay? And, and you will see how a blowfly looks, okay? Typically, it takes three to four weeks um, for a complete life cycle of a blowfly to take place. Okay, um, and it is very species dependent. So depending on what species actually infests the, the dead person, um, it, the time could vary a little bit. The time also varies with the ambient temperature that is around, okay? So the stages are of the blowfly, the egg, where, uh, where the female comes at the site and first lays eggs, then the larva will develop and the larva are nothing but maggots. I don't know, has anybody seen maggots? Has anybody seen maggots before? Yes. Okay, they look pretty gross, right? That's They're pretty gross looking. I, yeah. I don't know, I, I, don't, I, I, I personally Depends don't like the sight of maggots. Um, and then they become adults and then the cycle continues. Now you can tell the time of death uh, by knowing what type of, what at what stage the larva or the adult is, okay? So the larva stage by far is the most recognized stage um, and they consume all food and then the larva will start to feed on wet living or dead flesh, okay? So the larva will eat pretty much anything, okay? So the life cycle of a blowfly, so this is a blowfly, by the way, the actual size of the blowfly is this, okay? Um, so the first thing, they can actually smell dead tissue, okay? And they come very quickly where the dead person is. And the first thing they do, as soon as they come, as soon as they see a dead body, is they come and they start laying eggs, okay? The eggs are usually laid in all the orifice. Orifice are the openings of the body. So the eye sockets, the nostrils, the mouth, these are all the open areas in the body. So they will lay eggs in all the orifices and they also lay eggs in all the wounds, okay? Within the 24 hour period, so in day two, the eggs will hatch and a little larva comes out. Those larvas over the next three to seven days will develop into a maggot, okay? And there are different stages of this maggot that we will look at. At day eight to day nine, the larva forms a hard cocoon shell and begins to develop adult features, okay? So just like, remember how a caterpillar goes through the chrysalis stage and becomes a butterfly. Of course, over here, there is no butterfly. It becomes, once the cocoon ruptures and opens, it becomes, it forms an adult blowfly, okay? Um, so 
there is there is a picture over here that can be pretty intense for most of us. This is, of course, um, a decaying dead body. And as you can see, there's a lot of decomposition going on. You can see the color um, has changed. Um, you can see there's still original color over here, but the color on the hands, the face, and so forth has changed. And what is very visible is if you look at all the orifices, like the mouth, the nose, and the eye area, the ears, you can see the white spots, and the white spots are maggots. Okay, so the blue fly has laid eggs in the eye, nose and mouth and the ear area. And that usually is because we have mucous membranes in those areas. So those areas tend to be wet and moist. And so are wounds. So it's a nice nourishing environment for the fly to lay eggs. I know it can be a little intense. Um, so the, the blue fly will lay eggs in all these oh, areas. Oh, 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 oh. What happened? Nothing. It's uh, okay. disgusting. Yeah. Uh, well, it is intense, like I said. Uh, and then the maggots will hatch within one day, right? And you can study the different stages the maggot is at to determine the time of death. Okay. Now, there are some things to keep in mind, okay, when you're doing. So the adult female blowfly arrives within minutes to lay eggs on a cadaver. These flies can actually smell death, okay? Um, she can deposit up to 250 eggs at a time in natural openings of the body, which is the mouth, the eyes, the nose area, the wounds, and so forth. The eggs will hatch within the first 24 hours and the maggots will come out. Okay, so let's look at uh, what are the stages. So you have a female female blowfly that will come at the site of the cadaver and she will lay at least 250 eggs at a time, right? This is the male. The male is always smaller than the female and then it develops into an embryo. And these are the stages of the maggot. So we have the first instar larva, the second instar larva, the third instar larva, the pre-pupa, and then the pre-pupa stage. And then it becomes an adult. OK, so um, a forensic entomologist will come at the crime scene, will look at the maggots, will actually collect the maggots. And what are the other factors that should be noted? So what should be noted is what type of vegetation is close by? Is the dead body lying in a very moist, warm environment that will actually um, encourage the growth and development of these maggots? Okay, and the, the person who is the entomologist will collect a few of these maggots and will take them back to the lab in order to ID them. Okay, all right. So the first thing they do is for identification is they will actually take those maggots, put them in, let's say this temperature was, the person was found at temperature 78 degrees, okay? They will actually take those maggots and they will recreate that environment in the lab and they will grow them at 78 degrees in the lab or at different temperatures to see how the development of the maggot changes. Because if you have to calculate the time of death based on entomology, Remember, their life cycle is highly influenced by the temperature, the ambient temperature. So they will actually recreate the crime scene temperature and moisture level and everything and grow these maggots to study their life cycle. Once they get a hold of how the life cycle goes, the time period, then you can, then they will develop a graph. So you can see in this graph, we have, we have, on the x-axis, we have the life cycle stages of the blowfly. On the y-axis, we have time in hours, and we have two different temperatures at which they have been grown. The red dotted line is 23 degrees centigrade, and the 16 degrees centigrade is the one that is the blue solid line, okay? So you can see so if you're looking at the first instar that's the first stage of the maggot it is number one number two corresponds to the second instar maggot stage number three corresponds to the third instar number four to the pre-pupa 
number five to the pupa stage, and number six is the adult, okay? So now we have a few questions to answer. Number one, it says, identify what stage this life cycle is in. So they have given you this and they're asking you, what stage is this life cycle in, right? Yes? So, um, so if I look at this and I go back over here, to me, it looks like it's in the pupa stage, okay? So the answer to question number one, it's in the pupa stage. Then it says, look at the ambient temperature of 16 degrees centigrade. So you're looking at the solid blue line. How long has the body been diseased in hours and in days? Okay, so now we know that this is the pupa stage is found in the dead body. The pupa stage corresponds to number five. So I'm looking at five and I'm looking at 16 degrees centigrade. So I will draw an imaginary vertical line from number five all the way to number 16. And then I will draw a horizontal line all the way to the Y axis. Okay, and I get 480 hours. So how long has the body been diseased in hours? The body has been diseased for 480 hours. And then it says how many days? Remember there are 24 hours in a day. So if you divide 480 divided by 24, correct? And I need to do that. For 20 hours, 20 days. Yeah, 20 days, okay? So this person has been dead for 20 days. Then it asks, the person was found diseased on 320. What was the approximate calendar day the, la the person was last seen alive? So, March 1st. sorry? March 1st. March 1st. Okay. So there are some online resources. I think they've also been placed in the online resources tab under your module five. You should watch these. These are really interesting entomology videos. Unfortunately, I cannot show you them because we have, it, it chews up a lot of bandwidth and they're not, you cannot hear properly or, you know, stuff like that. You should watch them and you should ask me questions if you have, you can watch them on your own. Uh, and then um, there is a worksheet on entomology. Okay, let's look at the worksheet. I'm going to stop sharing this. I'm going to go to screen share. And of course, uh, hold on. Where do I go for this? Um, okay, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to go back. And we are in number five worksheet. So we're going to be looking at the entomology worksheet. Stop share, screen share, and I believe this is the entomology worksheet. Yes. Okay, so we have the entomology worksheet, which looks very much like the example we just did. We have a 16 degree centigrade, which is a solid blue line, and we have a 23 degree centigrade, which is the dotted red line. Okay, and then we have the life cycle of this glowfly over here. And number one corresponds, so it's a little different here. Number one corresponds to egg. In that one, number one corresponded to first instar. So please be careful. Read the question very carefully. So number one corresponds to the egg stage. Number two corresponds to the first instar. Number three corresponds to the second instar, number four to the pre-pupil stage, number five to the pupil stage, and number six to the adult. Now, the first thing I would do in this worksheet is when I print it out, I would write it over here. Egg, first instar, second instar, pre-pupil, pupil, and adult. Okay, that's the first thing I would do because it makes things so much more clearer. Yes? Yes? Okay. The first question asked is, for the pre-pupil postmortem intramural, what is the, at 23 degrees, how many hours? So we have pre-pupil, 
pre-pupil is number four at 23 degrees so it's a red dotted line so i'll draw an imaginary vertical line over here and then an imaginary horizontal line to the y-axis <coughs> how many hours does it take <coughs> for the pre-pupil stage to develop post-mortem interval and the answer is what is the answer 400. sorry <coughs> What is the answer? Post-mortem interval, how long does it take the pre-pupil stage to develop? So pre-pupil stage is number four. So you draw a horizontal, an imaginary vertical line and then an imaginary horizontal line to the time. What is my answer? Come on, that's not hard. Is it eight? It is what? Eight. Eight? Yeah. No, it's 200, right? Um, Look over here. So it's pre-pupil is four, and it says at 23 degrees centigrade, how long, what is a postmortem interval? How long does it take? So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna draw a vertical line over here all the way to the 23 degrees centigrade dotted line, and then a horizontal line all the way to the Y axis. What is it? What is the time interval? What is this over here? What's that number here? I think that's 200. Yes, that's 200 hours, right? So it takes 200 hours for the pre pupil stage to develop post mortem at 23 degrees centigrade. Okay, how many days? How do you calculate 200 hours into days? Divide by, Divide by 24. Divide by 24, right? Should give you the answer. The second one is similar. You're looking at the 16 degree one. So you will be looking at the solid blue line. Then let's do second instar, postmortem interval. When does a second instar show up postmortem interval at 23 degrees centigrade? So second instar is number three, correct? Second instar is number three. And what was the temperature? Uh, second in star at 23 degrees centigrade. So number three is so I'm gonna draw an imaginary vertical line to the 23 degrees, so the red dotted line, and then a horizontal line all the way to the y-axis. So it's right over here. What's the time? 140. 140 hours. How do you convert 140 into days? Five by 24. Divided by 24. That's all it is. Okay. Now, this one is a little tricky. Let's do number seven. Number seven is tricky. It's percent. What is the post mortem interval when you have 50% is in the first in star stage and 50% in the second in star stage at 23 degrees centigrade? So, first in star stage, first in star stage is number two. Right, is it number two? First in star stage, yes, at 23 degrees. So that is, you draw an imaginary vertical line and you can take a ruler and draw on the graph, okay? And then an imaginary horizontal line. So that is what? What is that? What 80. is this number I'm looking at? How many, how many R's? 80. 80. And then it says 50% are in the second in star stage. So the second in star stage is number three. So I draw an imaginary vertical line all the way up and then go horizontal, which is, what is that number I'm looking at over here? 140. 140. Uh, 140, okay, so you have yeah, 80 and 140, and it says 50% are in the first instar, 50% are in the second instar. So you take 80 plus 140 and divide that by two. And you should get 110 yeah. hours. Yes. Yeah. And then you convert 110 hours into days divided by 24 should give you the days. And then you can calculate that for 16 hours. So that was an easy worksheet, right? Yes. So as easy as it sounds, when you are a forensic entomologist, remember the first thing you do is go to the site 
you know, where the, where the murder has taken place, you collect all these maggots at different stage, bring them back to the lab, grow them at the ambient temperature where you found them, recreate those conditions, grow them in the lab, come up with this chart, how many days it takes for this thing to go into different stages, put this graph, and then you have to calculate. So all that stuff has been done for you. You're only getting the answers, right? If you were a forensic entomologist, you had a lot of work to do, correct? Correct. Yes, okay. So do you guys have any more questions? I have this recorded. I did not record this. I already have this recorded so I can attach the recording uh, right there next to, the, uh, next to your lecture PowerPoint. I will, I will, uh, I will attach it right after. Uh, in fact, I can do it while you are here. Um, stop share, screen share. So you know exactly where it is. Um, PowerPoints. Can you guys see this? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to go to edit on my end, and then I'm going to put access, access the lecture. And worksheet. Worksheet. Okay. And Go to pages, I believe it is this one. Let's see, I'm gonna save. Okay, can you guys see? Yes, we can. Okay, so you have access to the lecture on entomology and you have access to the worksheet for entomology um, that is in a lecture form. Yes? How are you guys doing? Do you have any more questions? No. Any questions, guys? Yes, no? No questions. No. No questions? Okay. So make sure you finish all the worksheets. Uh, before we meet next Tuesday, you also have, please make sure you start responding to, uh, what is that, your your discussion board, okay? The discussion board will take some time because you will have to research, you'll have to put what areas you research and why you think death penalty is good versus why you think death penalty is not good. And then you have to respond to your peer as well. So please make sure you do that well ahead in time, okay? Don't try to cram on that one. Okay, so if you don't have any questions, can I go ahead and end the Zoom meeting or do you want me to do any other worksheets for you? I think you can end it. You're good? Okay. So everyone's fine with me going and ending the Zoom meeting then? Excuse yes. me? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Do you have a question? Uh, can you... Uh... Can you teach me about the worksheet uh, 2B? Uh, can I what? I'm sorry. I didn't understand what you said. Can you, uh, can you teach me how to, uh, how to, how to do it in, in a, about the worksheet uh, 2B? Can I teach you how to do worksheet 2B? Yeah, I'm, yes. From last week? Yes. Okay, hold on. Which worksheet? Do you, this one? How, uh, this, one. The, this one. This one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this one, you're looking at, again, the short tandem repeats. 
Um, and remember, so when you do the Y chromosome, okay, um, you have at this loci, you have a 13 base pair repeat. At this loci, you have a 14 base pair repeat. At this loci, you have a 10 base pair repeat. At this one, a 14 and this one at eight, right? So now we're looking at DYS392. So DYS392 is a loci you're looking at. So you should have a 14 base pair repeat somewhere. So you have to, so I'm asking you, number one, what is the base sequence of the repeat? Okay, number two, the number of times it is repeating. And you should already know the answer to that. It is 14 times. And how do you write that? Okay, so I am going to look at this whole sequence and see where it is repeating. Okay, so I should have something that's repeating 14 times. And if I look through this, I don't find anything in the first line. I don't find anything that's repeating in the second line, right? Everything is very random, right? And then I look at the third line and then I start seeing a pattern, mm. right? For example, I see a pattern over here, GTT, right? GTT, yeah. GTT, GTT, and it's repeating all the way. Uh, hold on, G, GTT, right here. It's only repeating until here, correct? Mm. Then count, so what is the base sequence? It is GTT. Base sequence is, I should have highlighted this. Right? That's the one that's repeating. What is the base sequence is GTT, correct? The number of times it's repeating, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. So how many times it's repeating is 14. And how do you write this? You will write it as, this is how it is written. And I'm looking for a square bracket, sorry. Uh, hold on. GTT. 14. That's how you write it. Yes? Yes. Okay. So that's all that one is. And then you can do the other ones, which are very similar. It's asking you the same thing. So it's looking, you're looking at the low side D by S19. So if you look at DYS19, there should be a 13 base pair repeat there. Mm. Okay? Sure. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. No. Can I go ahead and end the Zoom call then? Yes. Go okay, ahead. so I think the recording for this has, has already been made available. So you should have this because I didn't record anything right now. Okay. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye, guys. Have a good day. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.